light, which was true light, which gives light to all in the world. The new descended for your love is endless. Glory to God on high. Shalom and welcome to In the Beginning. I'm Rabbi Eric Tokacher of Brit Am Messianic Synagogue in Pensacola, Florida. My co-host, Rabbi Wayne Leland of Am Yisrael, has the uh, day off. But I have a special guest that I'm very excited about, and that is Greg Silverman. And he was uh, with us yesterday morning leading worship at our synagogue, an amazingly talented worship leader as well as an educator. And we're just excited to have him here. I want to remind everybody that that beautiful song that opens and closes our program is written and directed uh, by written and produced rather by Tamara Aaron Alexander and you can find out more about her and her music by going to psalmplace.com that's psalm place.com the song was sung by natasha kraus reynolds and you can also find her music by going to psalmplace.com uh, for those that are regular listeners you know you can call in at 623-1330 623-1330 or you can go to our facebook page and post a question or a comment on the facebook page in the beginning radio program that's in the beginning radio program and greg it's so great to have you on the program today introduce yourself to the folks and uh let us know a little about yourself i'm really glad to be here rabbi thanks so much for having me on the air with you today my name is greg silverman and i'm a messianic jewish recording artist and praise and worship leader i'm based out of new jersey and i live there together with my wife and our two two wonderful sons uh eight years old and six years old and uh, I travel as my full-time job, um, going to give worship concerts, uh, teaching on worship, leading uh, praise and worship, meeting with other worship leaders and so forth across the country. And um, this is the ministry that we believe God has called us to. Amen. And one of the things I really love about you, and, and this isn't a uh, put-down to anybody else, uh, but your music style is is broad and vast. You're you're not buttonholed into one particular uh, genre of of music. Your your music is clearly worship. It's clearly messianic, but it's not necessarily what you would call always traditional messianic. And uh, you have a very high regard for education. As a matter of fact, uh, because we've been friends for uh, quite a while now, uh, you just finished your doctoral. Uh, you got your doctorate in uh, 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 directing, and uh, so tell us a little about that. What made you know so many worship leaders or uh, or people they they really focus on playing and writing and, and doing all that? What made you uh, feel the push, the the emphasis to not only uh, read and, and study, write, and do all that stuff, but actually do the educational part behind? Uh, which I, I believe, and you're going to share some of the doors that that has opened and will open for you in that direction. You know, it's important to grow. Uh, you know, we always want to be growing. And, and I heard someone uh, say, uh, or perhaps I read it, that, that if, you're not, if something's not growing, then it's probably dying. It's, it's one or the other. So, so in order for, uh, for me to, to be moving forward, I just thought it was really important. I've always had a dream and a desire to, uh, to hold a doctoral degree in music. And, uh, and specifically, this is a doctoral degree in classical choral conducting from the University of Arizona. And um, it was about a three-and-a-half-year process. It finally arrived, the diploma finally arrived in the mail just earlier uh, this month, uh, January, is when it, it, uh, when it finally showed up. So, um, so this is, uh, you know, fresh and, and new. This is a new start for us. Um, I, I was a worship director um, music director and uh, youth director at Congregation Beth Yeshua, which is a Messianic synagogue in Philadelphia, for a, a full time for about six years. And that was our home congregation. That's still the home congregation of our family now. And um, when I was there, I was, um, I was glad to be directing, uh, you know, especially different teenage groups, youth worship, and writing different things and so forth. Um, but now, uh, to get, now with this this uh, degree coupled with the ministry experience, I think that we'll be able to 
give the worship concerts, teach praise and worship leaders, teach musicians, but also have an impact in the academic settings and the university settings and um, become a professor coupled with the ministry and do all these things, I think it's going to fit hand in hand nicely. Yeah, I like the idea. We were talking yesterday uh, about the fact that you're, because of your degree, because of your educational background, that certain doors are open to you that aren't necessarily open in academia in that realm. It's almost like blending a worship ministry with a marketplace or, you know, where you can reach out. You know, certain people go into business not only to make a living, but because the only way to be able to network and reach those people in that particular business is to be involved in that. And uh, there's in academia, as, as most of our listeners know, and, and anybody who pays attention is not really right now having a strong uh, uh, push towards uh, godliness, righteousness, biblical values, those kind of things. And there are so many people in the academic realm that are secular or humanist or anything else. And so if we don't have strong believers that go into that environment, then they, we don't have the opportunity to reach out and share and minister to that segment of our society, which honestly has a huge amount of influence, especially on our young people, you know, teenagers, elder teenagers and, and young uh, 20s and, and early 30s that are in that ab- academic world largely have influence from people that are not uh, believers or strong believers or, or have a biblical uh, value basis in their life. I like that word influence. You know, I, I agree that academia definitely has one of the it's it's one of the mountains of influence, so to speak, um, in in our world today. And and we want to um, you know, there's a Hebrew word kesher, which uh, has to do with connection. And and I would like to um, I would like to see there be um, more people in academia who are paying attention to Messianic Jewish things, more people in Messianic Jewish uh, things, things, uh, paying attention to uh, academic and educational things. So we, we really want, you know, God wants us to reach people in all kinds of communities, and um, and I do think that this could open doors like that. Um, in fact, the the doctoral thesis that I wrote and conducted music and, and lectured on at the end of the process at the University of Arizona. It was on a piece of music by a classical composer named Darius Mio, and this was a classical composer that classical students and professors know and respect. The words that he used were right out of a, a traditional Jewish liturgy. So this is already a mixture of Hebrew liturgy together with classical music, and and so. Uh, I think that, that those kinds of projects can get a lot of people listening all at the same time in, in various communities. Right. Well, simply uh, put that, people that love classical music would be interested in a project like that, that right. have a real uh, love and heart for that. Uh, traditional Jewish people who do not yet believe in Yeshua, as both you and I do, uh, would be interested because it's a tradition. It's based on traditional Jewish liturgy, mm-hmm. traditional Jewish prayers that are prayed and have been for thousands of years. Yes. And uh, it gives you that influence into both of those worlds without having to compromise any of your faith to reach those two worlds Mm -hmm. and to do it with excellence, to do it with, uh, you know, not just slapping something together, not just getting by, but to really do it with excellence. And so, you know, that's that's really interesting. We're going to talk more about that project as we go into the program. I'd like to introduce the people to one of your songs so that, you know, beyond just talking to you and hearing your voice, they'll get an idea of, and we're going to play over the course of this hour, uh, four of your songs because... Because, they, as I said earlier, they're vastly different from one to the next to the next. So it's, uh, you're not pigeonholed at all to a sound, uh, but to Yeshua, to worship, to praise. So uh, the song is, is entitled, None Like You. Why don't you share just a little bit about how this came about, and then we'll ask uh, uh, the technician to, uh, to play it for us. Well, None Like You, uh, I, we recorded that in 2010, and... Uh, it was with a, just a wonderful producer. His name is Dan Needham out of Nashville, Tennessee. And 
This is a song that we wrote. It is uh, based on the story of uh, King David at the end of his life when he realizes that it would be his own son, Solomon, who would build the temple. And in this passage, King David is so grateful to God, and he, um, he effectively says, you know, Who am I, O Lord my God, and what is my family line that you've just brought us here so far and blessed us so well? And uh, David goes on to say, Lord, there's none like you. And, and this is the, uh, the basis of this song, and, and some of the actual scriptures right from that passage um, are found in the lyrics of, of this track. Okay, well, let's let the listeners uh, get a, a taste of None Like You. Welcome back to In the Beginning. Our special guest this morning, 
Dr. Greg Silverman. Greg Silverman, I want to remind our listeners that our program is supported and sponsored by the Messianic communities across the Gulf Coast. One of those is Am Yisrael Messianic Synagogue in Navarre, Florida. Rabbi Wayne, my co-host, and his lovely wife, Rebbitz and Joy, are the leaders there. Am Yisrael meets at 8177 East Bay Boulevard. That's also known as Highway 399. They meet in the facilities of the Apostolic Church, and we encourage you to go by and visit with them upcoming on a Tuesday evening for Bible study or a Shabbat service uh, every Saturday. Their service begins at 1.30. You can find out more about Am Yisrael by going to their website, shalomnavar.com, shalomnavar.com. You know, uh, Greg, as we uh, talk about your music and, and your ministry uh, beyond the music, uh, you know, growing up, I, I listened to liturgy in synagogue, and one of the prayers that we prayed uh, that goes along with the song we just sang is the Micha Mocha, Micha Mocha Ba'eli Maranai, Who is like you, O Lord among gods? And the answer to that, uh, biblically, is none. There is none like him. There is but one true and living God who breathed and spoke life and the world into existence. And, and so when we share psalms like yours, it's, a, it's not only the, just a beautiful and meaningful experience, but it speaks biblical precepts and concepts uh, into the, the, uh, the melodies that you write. Uh, so, so how do you deal with, I, I know that uh, from speaking to you and knowing you that you have uh, your background, uh, comes from something a little similar to mine. I had a, a uh, my, my Jewish family, my father and mother, my uh, birth father and mother were both Jewish, but my stepfather, uh, who converted to Judaism, was Sicilian. He's Italian. And so I have influence in my family from a Sicilian background and from uh, a Jewish background. Uh, both of my grandmother's first words at every moment uh, a meeting were, you, you're, you need to eat. Uh, so we have that similar background, but you come from also a, a, a Italian Jewish background. Why don't you share a little about that and how you came to uh, Messianic Judaism and how I think your story is unique because you were really brought to Messianic Judaism through music and your connection to music rather than other mechanisms and formats of outreach. I, I had never really thought of it that way before. What you said at the end there, I think that's a good point that that. Not only am I a musician, but part of my testimony really has a lot to do with music. And um, uh, it, Let me interrupt you for just a minute, sure, because sure. we did get a, a question which goes right along with what I just asked. It just came in yeah. uh, from Linda. It says, I'd like to ask Greg, when did he get started in music, whether it was before his coming to faith or after and why? And so I just wanted to acknowledge Linda. By the way, Anthony, thank you for your work as technician and, and uh, playing that music you're going to be it's so important to have good people behind the scenes that make you sound good on the radio mm -hmm. so thank you for that and uh, go ahead and, and continue on and answer uh, Linda's question in the process yeah so um, my father is Jewish and my mother is Italian American and so um, so it was an interfaith uh, home when I was a, a young child and so uh, we would go to Jewish holidays with dad's side of the family and then we would go to churches with mom's side of the family. And um, especially on my mother's side, uh, I, I felt as though my, grand, my Italian grandmother was, was uh, like a spiritual mother to me in a lot of ways. Um, she was really praying for me and believing God for me. And um, I, was, I was influenced by her and just wonderfully. I actually accepted the Lord uh, at a church with my Italian grandmother when I was just about eight years old and uh, later on I would continue to take myself to churches and, and I wanted to be a, around uh, Christian things but I still knew that I was Jewish I still appreciated my Jewish heritage still going to the Jewish holidays um, then when I was out of college there was a man who I was working for in New York City um, who was a gospel musician I was working at churches, I was teaching music, doing things like that. This was after the college years, right there in, in Brooklyn, right in Manhattan. And so, one time when I was talking to this man, I was asking him about Jewish things and my Jewishness, and, and he said something that was so 
uh, insightful. It, I think it was a, a prophetic, uh, strong word for my life because it set me on a course. He said, Greg, you need to go find the Jewish people who believe in Jesus and ask them these kinds of questions. And, and it, uh, hope birthed in my heart. Uh, I needed to find the born-again Jews. And if you were like me, you didn't know they were out there. Uh, you know, I was. I came to faith also. You know, raised in an Orthodox home, a conservative home, and 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 going on. But uh, I didn't know there were other Jewish people that were out there. And when somebody first mentioned you, and that first, it was like this light bulb went off within me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I just didn't know how to find the Messianic Jews. I was living in New York City, and I and I thought to myself, I. I know they're out there. I can still kind of imagine what I thought the congregation would have looked like, but I, I couldn't track them down. Where are these folks? So I went to a Chosen People Ministries meeting in New York City. That was helpful. And um, Mitch Glazier, who's, who's still, I think, the, uh, the leader of that organization yes. to this day, he was there that particular night um, back uh, around 2000 or so when, when this was happening and he prayed for me and I still remember it just being very strong and impactful and, and he was believing that God had a good purpose and a plan for my life. Um, just as a side note, God has a good purpose and a plan for everybody's lives. Absolutely. So, um, so then after living in New York City, I moved down to, to Philadelphia to go to Temple University to study classical choral direction. Um, I hold a master's degree in, in classical choral music, uh, conducting. And while I was there, a friend invited me to go to the Messianic Synagogue in Philadelphia, which is called Beth Yeshua. That uh, translates House of Salvation or House of Jesus. And so we went, and when we got in, I felt so much as though I had spiritually come home. It was It was what I was looking for for all of that time. And... Uh, being there at that congregation, I, I called it my spiritual home, and I stayed for many years. Now, this is the interesting thing. My very first time inside the congregation there, um, Beth Yeshua, it turned out to be a concert by Marty Getz, who is one of the most wonderful messianic recording artists of our movement. And so, uh, so that was really special uh, for all those pieces to, uh, to fit together there. And so the lady was asking if I did music beforehand or after. I, I actually did music, um, you know, all along. But I, I was, you know, I was meeting with God and, and getting to know God more as a child. But uh, as early as kindergarten, I was already playing the piano and singing songs and stuff. Yeah, you made a, a statement earlier about that if you're not growing, you must be dying or might be dying. Or, and uh, it's interesting when I speak to people like yourself and others that are believers that they can actually uh, track that, you know, I started when I was eight and then I went here and then God led me here and he, I followed him here. And, and it's very much a, a journey we have with the Lord. A lot of people come to faith and, and they get discouraged because they, they aren't where they want to be yet. But the reality is that we get there when we follow the cloud, when we follow the fire, when we follow where the Lord is leading us. And it's a step-by-step-by-step-by-step process. I heard somebody say, I'm, I'm not necessarily where I want to be yet, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the things that's been a blessing to me, uh, is the Messianic Times newspaper. I, I uh, work with it, and, and now I'm uh, the publisher of it. But one of the things that I've had an advantage of because of my involvement with that is connecting with people like yourself, people like Marty Getz, Paul Wilbur, the Messianic artists that are on Joshua Aaron, and, and so many. Now, you know, years ago when I first became a believer, there were only a couple of of Messianic artists that were going around and we learned uh, their songs and we sang their songs and pretty much if you went to a Messianic synagogue you were going to hear their music uh, it's thrilling to me to hear the, the newer artists and not even necessarily the younger artists because the uh, you know, I don't want to you know, burst your bubble, but at 40 years old, you're really no longer the young artist in the, mm -hmm. in the group. Yeah. But uh, but people that are coming to uh, to faith, Jewish artists, Jewish, I mean, gifted, talented musicians that are bringing their own sound, their own feel 
to uh, to the Messianic music, and so it's really thrilling to me. I want to let our listeners know that uh, Messianic Times is the international news source of the Messianic movement, both in print and on the web, and we encourage you to go by MessianicTimes.com to uh, check out. And actually, if you look at the Messianic Times uh, website right now, you'll see right on the very top of it, is a picture of Greg Silverman and an announcement that he was going to be in the Daphne and Pensacola area this weekend. So I encourage you to go by MessianicTimes.com and check that out. Not only will you find out about worship artists and ministries, but you'll find out what God is doing around the world through the Messianic movement, and you may want to become part of that. Uh, So uh, I encourage you to do that. Now, the next song that... uh, that Anthony is going to play for us in, in just a moment is called Dry Bones. And it happens to be my favorite uh, of your songs. Uh, and, and you knew that before I said that because we've discussed it before. But it, it's just such a powerful message that uh, speaks to, uh, to me through it. And uh, the reality of uh, that God really supernaturally and sovereignly answers our prayers, changes our hearts, and that he does bring life from the dead. So share a little bit about that, and, uh, and then we'll get Anthony to, uh, to play that song. Well, shortly after I joined Beth Yeshua in Philadelphia and became part of the Messianic Jewish movement, I was just having uh, special times in prayer, special times with God. I was so excited to be there, so excited to be part of it. And there was this one particular morning when I just flipped open my Bible, and it just fell open to Ezekiel chapter 37. And this is a passage that starts off something like this, that the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and the Lord set me in the middle of a valley, and the valley was full of dry bones. And so... In this vision, God speaks to the prophet Ezekiel, shows him these pile of dry bones, and tells Ezekiel to speak to them that they would come back to life again. And so Ezekiel does speak to the bones, and they do start to come back to life physically first, where the bones are coming back with the other bones, there's tendons that happen. But but still, there was no breath or ruach or wind or spirit in these bones yet, so they were physically alive but not spiritually alive yet. And then Ezekiel continues on. He speaks breath into the bones. And now these bones are alive, both physically and spiritually. And later in the same passage, the Bible says that these bones are like the whole house of Israel, or that these bones are the whole house of Israel, something like that. So, so this reminds us, very clearly of the way Israel became a nation physically first in 1948 uh, after after not being a nation for about 2,000 years. And, and who's ever heard of that kind of thing anyway? Because, because there were a lot of nations 2,000 years ago. There were all kinds of ites. There were the Israelites, but there were also Jebusites and Ammonites and Amorites and Amalekites and all sorts of things. But But as far as I know, all those different ites didn't wind up getting themselves a nation again after 2,000 years. It's only the Israelites. God did something special in the nation of Israel, and they became a nation again in 1948. But but then in 1967 and the years following that, around the time when Jerusalem came back into Jewish hands and, and so forth, there must have been a spark in the heavenlies because right after that, there wound up being... Uh, this Jesus movement and a, and a revival right in the United States where lots of Jewish people were coming to know Yeshua, Jesus, as their Jewish Messiah. And, and eventually this uh, turned into Messianic congregations and our Messianic movement and all. You know, so, it's interesting that at the time in 1948 and before, starting with the Balfour Declaration and others, there was a great argument among Judaism about should we support this happening because this is a political event that's happening, bringing about the state of Israel, the restoration, 
And they always had pictured this supernatural rising of Israel by the, the power, the voice, the, the word of God, that God would bring it about sovereignly, and it wouldn't be political powers and, and uh, you know, those things going on. And so there was this great argument that we're, we're not going to support this until God does it sovereignly, until there's a supernatural thing. But they miss the fact uh, many miss the fact that it was a supernatural thing that God brought through these uh, agencies. And just as the prophet said, first there would be a physical restoration, and then there would be a spiritual restoration. And we're seeing the fullness of that now as we have well over 120 congregations of, of Jewish believers in Yeshua in Israel, uh, almost 400 in the United States, as well as congregations in Africa and Japan, Australia, Central South America, just all over Canada, all over the world, there's this rising of the spiritual uh, change and, and invigoration and rest restoration of the Jewish people to their faith after the, the physical uh, and I really like what you're saying, Rabbi, too, because there can even be a personal application to that idea that we just don't know how God's going to do something sometimes. That that they were thinking that, that God needed to restore Israel in some kind of uh, way with, with big strikes of lightning, right. perhaps. Maybe the, <laughs> the, the Red Sea parting again, right. or, or uh, you know, a, a wind coming in and driving the enemy right. out, or or something that was supernatural. And there's been times in my own life when... I, I was praying for something, and I was believing that God was just going to zap it, that he was going to do it a supernatural way. But when I look back, I see, well, God did answer my prayer, and he did bless me. He did it in some other kind of, maybe he, perhaps he brought certain people into my life or other things that were just, they just seemed like a, a series of natural events, or they were a series of natural events, but God was orchestrating it and blessing it. I, I heard someone say that sometimes if we pray for a, a tree, he'll just give us an acorn. <laughs> right. And, and also, it's really important, for some That's reason, amazing. we think that God moves supernaturally through uh, storms, wind, lightning, the earth opening up, different things happening, and that somehow it's less supernatural for God to move on the hearts of men to accomplish his purposes than it is for God to move the trees or the birds or the... And when it's the same God and his creation that he is influencing by his spirit, whether it's people accomplishing his purposes or whether it's birds, trees, animals, frogs, things like that happening. And we don't want to lose track of, of the fact that it's the same sovereign move of the uh, the all-powerful, almighty creator that accomplishes whether it's through people or through uh, nature. Yeah, and quite frankly, sometimes it might be easier for God to to uh, do a whole big storm than it would be to convince a certain person to change their heart or change their direction or change their mind. But, but yeah, God's working on the hearts of people, and he's working through circumstances all at the same time. He's got over all of it. Absolutely. So uh, we're going to play the song Dry Bones and, and give a, a people a, a different taste of, of your style. So this song Dry Bones, then, it, it, talks, it starts off talking about the passage from Ezekiel 37, which is this prophecy that we've been discussing. But I also feel like this story relates to my own personal story because I'm so grateful to God that he's taken the dry bones in my own life, so to speak, and brought them back to life as well. Amen. was upon me, and he brought me out by his spirit. The Lord set me in the middle of the valley. He was full of dry bones. He led my feet among them. Then he asked me by his spirit, Son of man, can we I know that I could heal 
them I know I could heal them on my own But the Lord said unto me You'll need a testimony So say to the dry bones live Say to the dry bones live set my eyes upon him then he asked me by his spirit can these lives be healed why did he ask me when he already knew the answer why did he tell me to say Which really caught my attention Then the peace of God came over And Yeshua reigned He rained down His Spirit And He rained down His power He rained down His glory And He reigned Welcome back. You're listening to In the Beginning. I'm Rabbi Eric Tocher, my special guest this morning, Greg Silverman. What an amazing song. And, and I love the song for so many reasons. One, uh, it just connects me personally with that kind of klezmerish Jewish sound, while at the same time having such a strong message of God's supernatural power, of His love for us, of the fact that He really does give us the power to overcome through His Spirit. And, and it's such an amazing thing. I want to remind our listeners that our program is sponsored and supported by the Messianic communities across the Gulf Coast. 
One of those is Congregation Mayim Chaim, the Eastern Shores Messianic Synagogue. Congregation Mayim Chaim is located at 1410 Highway 98, Suite K in Daphne, Alabama. That's 1410 Highway 98, Suite K in Daphne, Alabama, which is located between the Daphne Police Department and Terry Thompson Chevrolet. And they welcome you every Tuesday evening and on Saturday mornings. Go by and visit their website, shalomeasternshore.com, shalomeasternshore.com. And uh, Greg, that song to me is so powerful because it really speaks not only of what God did to those in the Bible. You know, sometimes people read the Bible and they think of the God of yesteryear, the God that was written about, you know, that Ezekiel and Daniel and uh, Isaiah, you know, had interaction with. But they sometimes don't make the jump to the fact that God really speaks to us now. He really loves us now. And he really wants to interact in a supernatural way to bring us to him, to draw us to him, through the provision of the sacrifice and atonement that was provided by Yeshua. I think this is really at the heart of worship, you know, that that God loves us so much that he did everything to make it so that we could have a personal relationship with him. Yeshua gave gave it all so that so that I could come into his presence and so with that kind of with that kind of covering and with that kind of encouragement from from God, I, I feel as though I can come boldly into the throne of grace. I can come boldly into His presence because because it's not about me. It's not about how good I perform or bad. I do this well. I don't do this well. I made a mistake. It's not. It's not about me. But but Yeshua. His blood covering over me, his atonement made it so I could come into his presence so that I could have a personal relationship with him, just like what you were saying. And it really is about having a personal relationship. It's really about connecting uh, with the God of of the universe who spoke everything into existence and formed man from the earth and breathed life into him so and and fellowshiped with them. When you read about Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve in the garden, they fellowshiped with God. And one of the things that I really love about uh, Dry Bones and, and other uh, songs that you do is it really inspires us to draw near to Him, uh, and not to do so necessarily. You know, too many people feel like they have to humble themselves by crawling on the ground and groveling before God to make deals with Him. Yeah. When, when it's really not the way, it's, it's important to me that people understand, you know, in, in the scripture, whenever uh, Moses was commanded to count the people or uh, other leaders of Israel to count the people, the, the, uh, the Hebrew says, Kiti sa et rosh b'nei Israel, which is translated, take a census of the people of Israel, but uh, Kiti sa at Rosh, it actually is, is saying, lift up the heads of the people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's actually giving the people value. And by giving them value, you make them count. It's not counting the people, but making the people count. That's good. And one of the things that, that uh, your music does and, and other people's that are worshipers and, and really connect in that way is they allow people to understand that God is not looking for an opportunity to zap them. And he's not this mean ogre sitting there hoping they'll crawl across glass and nails and tacks and all that to bloody, you know, uh, uh, visage of, uh, arrive at the throne and look up with their last breath and uh, gasp their need out. But like a father to his children, he invites us and gives us value, shows us our value. Now, here's an interesting point because, because, a lot of religion so a lot of religion this what we have what god has given us is a relationship with him but a lot of religions sometimes make people feel condemned or guilty or or i'm not worthy you know there's nothing good about me they, but this is this is not the way to approach a god who loves you uh, if you just think of use the word father a moment ago if you just think of a dad with his children 
how would the dad feel if the kids were were scared of him all the time? That's and and children, unless they've had a bad experience um, along the way, they're not they're not predispos uh, predispositioned to be that way. When I see the children, they run to me. They just run to me and they want a hug. If if they did something bad the other day, they had forgotten about it a long time ago by now. You know, I, if I said to the kids, let's go to the store and get uh, a toy, you know, they wouldn't say to me, well, you know, I didn't clean my room and I didn't do everything you told me. No, they would just hop in the car and we, they'd be thrilled to go get a toy. And, and I was offering because I loved them. And, and they came because they knew that they were accepted. So, so God has made a... He's made provision for us so that we are accepted. And, you know, to, to kind of wrap our heads around it this way, that in a sense it's, it's actually more of a arrogant or a selfish way of looking at things when you say how unworthy you are all the time because you're just focusing on yourself a lot. Whereby if we're just focusing on Yeshua a lot, focusing on Him and it's all about Him, we're thinking of Him, then we're just going to notice that that we're loved by him and we're in a in a right relationship with him because of his his love for us it's it's not about us it's about him right many of us are too proud of our humility and we really feel like our value our pride in ourselves comes from our lowering ourselves uh before him when the reality is that god has made us sons we are uh, princes in the kingdom. He has given us a position. He has given us an inheritance. He has given us those things, and he wants us to come to him in that way. The phone number here is 623-1330, 623-1330. If you'd like to call in and ask a question of Greg or myself, uh, I also want to remind everybody that my book, Oi, How Did I Get Here, is available on Amazon as well as on RabbiEricT.com. It's a great book for anyone who's in ministry or who knows someone who's in ministry, and I encourage you to pick up a copy for yourself and share it with other folks. Uh, it's. Uh, I know it'll be a blessing. Seth, welcome to the program. Oh, can you hear me, Rabbi? I can hear you. I got static on my line. I'm on a cell. Uh, well, welcome, Greg. Glad to have you on the radio show. You sound good. Your music's good. Thank you, Seth. Enjoy you. Uh, I have a question. You talked about fatherly, um, how should you say, influence on the children. You know. I can't remember the, I don't have a Bible in front of me or anything, but when the master gave the servants so many talents, and he gave the last one one, and uh, he came back for an accounting, so to speak, and the uh, the one that had the least talents uh, had buried his in the ground, and he said, I knew you were a, uh, like a demanding father, and you sowed where you, you reaped where you didn't sow, and you expected things and stuff and he said so I'm just going to give you back the talent that you gave me I guess my my question goes like this to some extent it seems as though the servants were rewarded according to their expectations and according to their attitude toward the master and I'll hang up I'm just like you to talk about that you know God is he's an overflowing and generous God and when he blesses us, he blesses us in an overflowing way. That's that's just the way he is. Um, he's the more than enough God. He's all sufficient. He's El Shaddai. When he provides, he likes to provide and then give more than enough. So, um, so I I hear what you're saying, Seth. That it seemed like the people, the the man in the parable with the least talents, had had a um, had God in his mind to be a stingy God. He, he thought he was a demanding and a stingy God. And, um, and God is, in reality, he's a loving and a generous God who just wants to bless us and love on us the way a good father would love on, good chil on, right. on his children. Yeah, it's absolutely important for us to understand that the lesson of this parable is not that God is an unjust ogre who's looking to stomp on people. But if you actually read the, the whole parable, you'll find out that, first of all, the master gave 
to the servants, freely gave of what was his to them, and gave them opportunity to not only uh, increase what he has, but be blessed by the provision that he had for them. That's a good point, Rabbi, that he just gave, you're saying that he just gave these talents. Right. So, you know, when, when God gives something to us, um, I think part of, part of uh, our human nature sometimes is to say, how did I earn this? Or did I earn this? Or what did I do to deserve this? The word deserve keeps coming into the mix. But, but what you're saying here is in this particular parable, he just gave it freely at the beginning. Right. There was no deserving to it. And, and too often we look at God's uh, gift to us and his blessings and we try to figure out why he gave it to us instead of just understanding that he loves us and that's why he gave it to us regardless of uh, who we are or our history. And then it goes on to give all three of them the different talents. Two of them uh, profit from the talent uh, and give back a return and they're blessed for that. The third one says, I knew you were this way, I knew you did this, I knew you did that, but there's absolutely no evidence from the text that that was actually sound knowledge. Mm -hmm. That was their thoughts, their opinion. I believe this. This is what I knew. Not what is truth, but what I knew. And so I didn't do this, and I didn't do that. And the answer was, well, if you really thought I was that way, why didn't you at least... You know, loan get interest on it. Why didn't you? If you really thought it was that way, why didn't you at least do a little mm -hmm. of what you were supposed to do? And too many people don't do anything because they have a false uh, understanding of who God is. And even though they think he's this ogre that that wants them to suffer and be punished and do penance and and go through you know all this tribulation and all these things. And, you know, they, so they don't do anything. They just hide their gifts, their talents, their, what they've been given. And then they're going to stand before God, and God's going to say, well, if you really thought that, you know, if I really think it's going to rain, I bring an umbrella with me. If I really thought I'm going to ha think I'm going to have a flat tire, I bring a spare tire with me. You know, there's, there's responses when we really think something. And this person not only had a skewed uh, understanding of who God was, but even in their skewed understanding, they showed a lack of faith in their skewed understanding of God. And part of part of the takeaway point here also mm -hmm. is that you know we just want to um, encourage all of our listeners that that God loves you and that He does have good in mind for you. He does have a gener generous heart toward you, and when He gives to you, He wants to see it grow. In the same way that a, a good dad would want to see his children uh, be blessed. Absolutely. And we, we've got time for one more of your songs. We're going to play Floodgates in just a second. But one of the things I love about this song is it's such a great picture of what God does. Because a floodgate not only protects the city, but when opened up, it allows the city to, the waters to flow through the right directed channels to keep from destruction happening. And God is like that. He by His Spirit, He protects us from harm. And when all things are prepared and the flow is set to happen the way it needs to, so it brings rain or water, it brings provision, it, it waters the ground and all that needs to be, but at the same time there's pres uh, preservation in place to protect everything else that needs to be protected. That's how God is with us. He pours into us. And, you know, people say uh, uh, God will not give us, the Bible says God will not give us any more than we can stand. And that's not only in bad things. But it's also in blessings. And God knows what we can take, and he opens the floodgates to allow the rushing water to come into our lives, to allow that, you know, out of their bellies shall flow rivers of living water, the Mayim Chaim, the waters of life. But he does so when everything is set so that it won't do us any harm, but it will only be a blessing to us. And uh, we're going to go ahead and let Anthony uh, play that, and uh, given any time afterwards, we'll, we'll talk some more.
heaven are full, they are heavy, about to fall on thankful heart. We are devoted to being thankful, so let the flood of the Welcome back to In the Beginning. I want to remind everybody that our program is sponsored and supported by the Messianic communities across the Gulf Coast. One of those is at my congregation, Brit Am. Brit Am meets in Pensacola, Florida at 6700 Spanish Trail. That's 6700 Spanish Trail. And you can check out our website at shalompensacola.com. Our congregation meets each Tuesday night for Bible study and on Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock. We encourage you and invite you to come out and join us where you'll find first century worship in a 21st century century world. I also want to invite you if you've loved listening to Greg's music, you need to go by and visit his website. It's gregsilverman.com uh, It's got more information about him, about his ministry. If you'd like to have him come by and, and serve at your congregation, that's where you can get a hold of him at. He would love to come by and, and be with you and not only share in, uh, in worship at your congregation, but also work with your worship team uh, to help them to, uh, to improve give a little insight, give a little help in that direction. And all of the uh, links to all the places we've talked about on our program, I want to remind you, are on our Facebook page, In the Beginning Radio Program. So if you weren't able to write down the links uh, all the way along, you can go there and just click on the Facebook page, and it will bring you to... Uh, to his uh, to his page, to the other pages of the different congregations, synagogues, and ministries we talk about on our program. So that's Greg Silverman. 
Com, and you can find out more about him, his music, and how to get a hold of him there. Greg, I'll give you just a few uh, seconds to close this out, and then we'll go to our closing song. Well, I'm just so glad to have been here uh, with you talking about these things. And, and God is an overflowingly loving God toward us, and, uh, and he's just... Uh, I just uh, pray blessing over everyone in the, uh, under the sound of our voices today. It's been a blessing having you. You've been listening to In the Beginning. Have a great week.